Huh. So basically, you don't want anyone to recognize you, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm just scared my new friends will think I'm a little weird if they see me fighting criminals. You think you can help me, Bulma? Well now, you could always not fight the bad guy. The character of Sun Gohan has always had his face hidden. Goku's son is someone else's project. Always. Whether he's been stolen as a bargaining chip, trained as a weapon, driven by guilt to an alien world, or forced into his father's shoes, Gohan never had much of a chance to be himself. For as long as he has existed, both as a character and a marketing device, he's always been emulating his father, or being what he needs to be. He's always been wearing a mask, without knowing what's under it. In this video, I'll first discuss some general real-world relevance to the character, and then the particulars of the show itself. So first, I'll tell you, I do not like Gohan. Never have. I don't have any malice for the character, but I just never think about him. I think about Gohan how most people think about Tien or Krillin. But I'll go ahead and tell you, this is not going to be a funny video making fun of Gohan. Quite the opposite. Well, it, it might have funny bits in it, just roll with it, and bear in mind, most times you see people making content about the character, it's made with a great love of the character that I don't really share. And there's probably a good reason for that. The very first thing that I ever saw of Dragon Ball was from a local TV station airing the Saban Distributed Z Ocean dub. It was 1996, and I was 14 years old. And yes, that means that I am a 200-year-old lich here to talk to you about anime. That scene specifically was Gohan wandering the wilderness during his training with Piccolo, before smashing a rock to test his strength. It wasn't long until he was cowering from Nappa and getting a bad haircut. Well, I'm more angry at myself for counting on him. What a waste of time. Just go home, Gohan. If you're not going to fight, you'll only slow us down. Like most other people, I wouldn't see any resolution to the Frieza saga until the series renewed its run past Goku's arrival to Namek in 1999 onward. By the time Gohan's infamous transformation vs. Cell was televised in December of 2000, I was well past the age of it resonating with me personally. I was in college when I saw it. Over time, I realized that a lot of his appeal was that he was a projection character. I'll explain. Video game protagonists often have no voice dialogue, so they're easier to project onto. You can imagine what Chrono is saying because of the convenience of him not saying it. Gordon Freeman can offend you by exhibiting personality traits you don't like, because the only traits he exhibits are the physical actions you perform in the game. Dead Space 1's Isaac Clarke is a quiet, controlled engineer, with no dialogue to draw you free of the experience of being Isaac Clarke. Dead Space 2's Isaac Clarke is an emotional, idiotic potty mouth that panics and throws tantrums. Fuck. Fuck. Shit. What the fuck? Holy shit. Oh, shit. Fuck. Which, given the scenario he's in, makes sense but you are watching his experience rather than having your own. Main characters are often generic or have no dialogue. Creators don't want them to be hated, which is why so many of them either say nothing or have nothing to say. Goku isn't a projection character. He has a very distinct personality that gets on a lot of people's nerves. He makes incredibly stupid decisions that invariably don't matter due to writer's convenience. He can be obnoxious, ignorant, and childish despite being nearly 50 years old and willfully selfish about his boredom to the point that it causes the erasure of entire universes. And then it's up to fans and future episodes to try to paint his warmongering as something you should be thankful for, because he's the protagonist. It's hard to project yourself on the Goku because he's a neutral development protagonist who acts as a foil to his villains. Gohan, in comparison, serves this role much better. He doesn't have a ton of personal agency or personality in the original story, much like a video game protagonist without a dialogue, he's a perfect canvas for this sort of thing. The perfect kind of character to be used by the everyman viewer. More importantly, he was around the same age as a lot of people watching the original Toonami runs during Z's biggest jump in American popularity. Not many people know this, but teenagers, especially teenage boys, often have fantasies about lashing out against bullies or teachers or adults that want to tell them what to do. Sometimes. They dress in dark clothes, and really want the world to know that they're very dangerous. But they're actually not. Shh, that's our little secret. The US has a self-celebrating culture. 
Embarrassed millionaire syndrome is common, and people love seeing the underdog everyman rise up to overthrow the privileged. This sort of culture creates a lot of edgy teenage boys that love to imagine that they're secretly a badass. Let me be clear, Gohan is not this. Gohan's a good boy. However, he does make for a great projection fantasy. The secretly powerful child who just so happens to be the same age as the reader, who, when pushed too far, is forced to unleash his inner demons, but remains innocent and admired for doing so. He's an empowerment fantasy. Writers worry a lot about their main characters having universal appeal, because people are incredibly self-interested. Projection and empathy are important. The more you have in common with someone, the easier it is to project onto them. And the greater that projection, the greater your self-interest for that character's success. We love to see ourselves, we love to see and create versions of ourselves, and we love to see our analogs beat the analogs of people we don't like. That's why straw men are so much fun. Humans are shallow, stupid, self-absorbed assholes. They think of themselves as the main character of the whole universe. Everyone else is a supporting character or a background character, and the people they don't like are just two-dimensional cartoons. Not you and me, though. No, no. We're fully realized, complex, rich. Even our flaws only serve to deepen the ultimate mystery that other people must unlock to discover more about themselves. Mmm, me. Me, I'm the best. Me. But of course, that's not all. You see, we're not only obsessed with seeing ourselves, but we're also obsessed with commercial products we identify with. Things. Things we happen to ascribe to ourselves. Over time, after a lot of debating and looking for the right term, I had to create a name for this. Comfort branding. This is the tendency for people, especially young ones, going through formative development, to become obsessed with a corporate brand. They start to see a product or a character or an intellectual property as being synonymous with themselves. Any attack on the IP is an attack on them which can elicit a rational, completely out-of-proportion rage. Anyone who's made anime videos of any kind is keenly aware of this behavior. This is especially common when we're all young, when experience is foundational, and the newness of that experience makes it integral to our interests and personality. It's one of many kinds of nostalgia that becomes a brand of comfort, branded onto you. If someone gets Star Wars wrong, death threat. If a kid learns that a shitty song they liked when they were 12 was a cover of a song made in 1984. Death Threat. If someone makes a Sonic game that's too dark and edgy. Death Threat. If someone makes a Sonic game that isn't too dark and edgy. Death Threat. If someone makes fun of Naruto. Lots of Death Threats. Sexualized Pokemon? Yes! Universal Praise! Alright, sorry. Focus. Humans love to see themselves especially in media, that's part of storytelling. And this is mostly what Gohan's problem is. Both in terms of in-universe and out, Gohan is a character written to be what he thinks the world expects him to be. Coincidentally, this is what I have empathy for. When I first started the channel, like many YouTubers, I had more of a stage personality, a character. The character of Plague, a weird old farmer that complains about things. This has mostly gone away over time, and... The last thing it was really in was in my anime videos, and it's there mainly because it's expected of me, it's funnier. There are many, many times during the writing of those scripts where it's necessary to misconstrue information, feign ignorance, or dramatically overreact because that's funnier to a general audience. Those are popular videos for me, probably my most popular, despite being a YouTube animator and a writer that has nothing to do with anime. Anyone that makes content online is probably aware of this sort of thing. It is a performance mask, one worn from marketing, that blurs the line between creator and product. In regards to Gohan, that's what I see. A character that wants to be free not only of his parents, his heritage, his gifts, but also free of his real-life fans. I considered making a Gohan video several times in the past, but always through the filter of the Plague character. If you can't tell, I decided not to really do that this time. Instead, I actually decided to write this script mainly due to a couple of videos by Totally Not Mark, called Rewriting the Boo Saga. Mark is a fantastic YouTube creator, and... Wait, is his name actually Mark? He's totally not Mark, so... Oh my god. Mark has a great love of the series. 
His videos are analytical and informative and break down the series on those terms. He's interesting and doesn't need to intentionally step on people's toes to be engaging. Go give him sweet kisses. That particular series was Mark attempting to rewrite and reorganize the Boo Saga to Gohan's benefit, as well as repair some character relevance throughout the story. One thing people eventually learn about me is that I love evaluating why I like stuff. Could it be designed to be more profitable? Would I enjoy it more? Could it be redesigned so that it had more widespread appeal? If it's a system, could it be more streamlined? To people that are more consumption-driven, not analytical, that comes across as complaining. That's where I got my name and my YouTube character. So if I come across like I'm complaining about something, it's usually because I enjoy it. I mention this because I gave some feedback to Mark and I immediately got worried when I left it that I'd come across as complaining or disrespecting his efforts. Quite the contrary. What I love most about his attempt was his focus on character and the emotional rhythm of the story. All of his foundational thoughts and motivations in his writing were spot on. It was just clean up on details that needed attention. In contrast, most of the time when I hear people's ideas for Dragon Ball stories, they focus on how strong the characters they like will get, what new forms they'll achieve, how big the battles will be, how cool the villain will look, and what minor details of the setting they'll bring back and combine, and so on. Themes or character arcs aren't usually mentioned beyond the desire for a favorite to be relevant again. Wanting those things is fine, of course. We all want those things. But they're actually just a small part of what makes Dragon Ball Dragon Ball. Those are the marketable bits, not the substantive ones. Gohan especially gets a lot of this stuff. When I see him in fan art or stories, he's often totally out of what little character he has. He's often a roided out version of the arrogant fighter we see before he loses to Boo. If fan interpretations were to be believed, Gohan would have a harem of every female character on the show and walk around with a scowl at all times, calling everyone he meets a retard cuck before one-shotting them. Basically a walking insecurity complex with a tiny penis. This is Chad Han a toxic manifestation of all the projection fantasies that Gohan, as a comfort brand, has found himself burdened with. While this is mostly just a joke to most people, and a funny one, some take it seriously. Needless to say, I'm not sure Gohan in Super even knows who he is yet, but he's not Chad Han, nor should he be. So, enough of all this hate and insecurity. Let's talk about who Gohan is under that creative mask. Let's distance ourselves from the anger, the projection, the expectations for greatness, and evaluate Gohan's character arc. What became of it, where did it go wrong, and what could have been done to improve it? As far as the anime goes, the first time we see Gohan, he's lost and crying in the woods, seemingly due to getting lost exploring his love of nature. In the manga, we don't actually see him at all until Goku shows up at Roshi's home. While I won't be covering all the differences between these two, it's at least important to note what Toei's impression of Gohan was versus Toriyama's. It is Toriyama, after all, who attempted to push Gohan into the spotlight and then decided against it. And contrary to rumor, fans had nothing to do with his decisions. Following his intentions is important to factor in. Not much is established about Gohan in his first appearance, other than he's polite, he has a tail, Goku sees potential in him, and Chi-Chi, his mother, refuses to allow Goku to train him. She's pushing him against Goku's wishes into studying. Gohan himself doesn't actually say anything other than his age before he's abducted by Raditz. Even during the fight, Toriyama doesn't even draw any shots of Gohan inside the pod. Gohan had no dialogue, he's just Goku's son, a living MacGuffin for our hero to chase. Eventually, he erupts from the pod, angry that Raditz hurt his daddy, wounds Raditz, and that's it. For now, that's Gohan. Goku's MacGuffin, and a plot device. After this point, he then becomes Piccolo's MacGuffin. Piccolo proves Gohan's potential, and we see our very first glimpse of what Gohan supposedly wants. Gohan claims he doesn't want to be a fighter. He wants to be a scholar. I'm not sure what to make of this statement. He's four, and we already know that's what Chi-Chi wants. Something that doesn't come through in localization is that Chi-Chi is a hick. Like Goku, she's a country bumpkin. Much like her husband, she doesn't really understand modern life or social standards. She's been raised alone by the Ox King Bandit in the woods without a mother, after all. She just has a vague understanding of cliches. In Dragon Ball, if you remember, she was chasing Goku because, in her mind, they had to be married because Goku patted her on the crotch. Therefore, they must be a husband and wife. 
She wants Gohan to be a great scholar because that's what good children do. They become doctors, or lawyers, or scientists, or so on. That's all she really knows or understands of the world outside of the wilderness. Stereotypes. She's a parody of the overbearing Japanese mother, who doesn't really understand her own demands. She only believes this is what a proper life should be, so that's the life I'm going to force onto my family. Gohan, then, is the target of Chi-Chi's ignorant fixation on proper futures for children. So when a four-year-old Gohan says that he doesn't want to be a fighter, just a scholar, the only thing I can think is... that's his mother talking. Chi-Chi has probably been pounding this into his head while Daddy was outside of the house. He hasn't been allowed to have a real childhood because his mother won't allow it. Meanwhile, Goku is negligent and selfish, so Gohan has no real context for anything he wants at this point. It makes me think of children that grow up being forced to learn the piano or dancing or so on. At the time, a lot of them resent their overbearing parents for forcing it on them. Some of them continue to despise their parents well into adulthood. Still, others may be thankful for it because it became part of their identity. Goku, as a child, had the benefit of being taught martial arts by a loving parent. The relationship he had with his grandfather was defined by the master-student relationship they shared. Afterwards, he learned alongside his best friend for the purposes of self-edification and fun. When actual danger appeared, Goku was ready, because his association with martial arts was wholly positive. Goku loves martial arts because that's his life. That's everything Goku is, and everything that Goku loves about being alive. Now, here is Gohan's association with fighting. His mother yelling at his father. His mother hates fighting. His father loves it. He's abducted by his uncle. His father is too weak to stop him. His father is murdered. His father's enemy abducts him, only to abandon him in the wilderness. He's rescued, only to be brutalized into learning martial arts. He's told that people want to murder him and his mother, and now it's up to him to murder them instead. He doesn't want to fight. He's five. He's made to, because he has genetic gifts from his father. The people trying to kill him and his friends and family are from his father's species. He's not human like his mother. His father is alien. His master is alien. Both live to fight. He is alien. His enemies kill the innocent because of their shared blood. He's told during the fight that everyone is dying because of his cowardice. He's guilted into traveling to an alien world to bring the dead back to life. More murders. More fighting. There's almost no joy or discovery in any of it. The closest friend he has is his father's best friend. He dies. The closest thing to an ordinary childhood friend is an alien boy they rescued. He dies. His abusive master, who lost his life saving him, is wished back and seemingly dies again. When Gohan's ordinarily kind-hearted father, Goku, undergoes a bloodline transformation in front of him, Goku looks down at his son and tells Gohan that he's so angry, he might just kill him too. Is it surprising at all that Gohan does not enjoy fighting? Is it surprising that he associates martial arts with death, anxiety, and hatred? Not self-improvement, not the memory of a loving parent, only the burden of being born better at killing than anyone else. Gohan is most praised when he loses control, stops being himself, and starts trying to murder people. I linger on this because it's so important to what Gohan becomes. If his experience learning about his heritage and ability was totally positive, who knows how his writing may have evolved. Dragon Ball obviously doesn't cover this sort of thing. Everyone in the show should have PTSD and be a walking mass of complexes if you are taking all this seriously. This is the same setting which a giant rabbit man who turns people into carrots is elevated to the moon by Goku and left there to make candy until the moon exploded, but we don't, we don't mention that. So maybe I'm projecting too much, reading too much into things. It's the job of the writer, after all, to inform, not the viewer. But... This is what I see, and in terms of events, that is what happens. Gohan not only suffered in-universe troubles around this time, but also began to suffer out-of-universe troubles as well. During the Frieza saga, Gohan gets his power unlocked. He goes from a resting power weaker than Raditz to being as strong as Vegeta was on Earth. Gohan didn't learn anything, he didn't train. He didn't go through decades of war like every other soldier in the universe had. A magical plot device man just made Krillin and him good enough to continue participating in the story. But this jump was nothing compared to what happened later. First, context. 
Frieza in this universe of veteran soldiers with power levels normally no higher than 5,000 was considered invincible in his first form. Then he transformed. Then, for fun, he did it again. He was now tens of millions of times stronger than Gohan was when he showed up a few days prior. And Gohan somehow nearly overpowers him, compelling Frieza to transform one last time. This five-year-old leapfrogs the entire history of the universe's greatest, most experienced soldiers just because he got angry. While I think obsessing over power levels is silly, they're still part of the setting, and the entire plot in between Goku arriving and turning Super Saiyan did massive damage to the setting that it hasn't recovered from to this day. Gohan just so happened to get the biggest boost for the least amount of effort. This established a very dangerous trend for how the character was used. Once power levels were thrown out the window and power scaling went batshit crazy, all the characters had to keep up. All those legendary soldiers from across the universe with power levels below 10,000 became jokes. Characters like Krillin, who would go on to stop training entirely and be endangered by bullets, would technically be millions of times stronger than soldiers who were born and raised on the battlefield. In fact, the strongest fighters in the history of the universe all now lived on present-day Earth. This is despite the fact that most of them, and their whole lives, had only ever been in combat a few times. This could have been explained, there could have been a new breakthrough that changed combat as a whole, the same way that the discovery of Ki changed martial arts. But that didn't happen. Characters that needed power to stay relevant simply got that power regardless of circumstances or logic. They didn't have to be on screen or have their progress explained. In fact, sometimes they didn't even have to do anything. Gohan, as a character lurking on the fringes of being a main character, got the worst of both worlds. He never did much of anything, but got massive, unexplained power boosts as he needed them. This all culminates in the end of the Cell Saga. While a lot of people consider this transformation to be the greatest moment in all of Dragon Ball, I've always considered it to be a narrative mess. I've made my thoughts on comfort branding clear, a lot of people become attached to the character for reasons I mentioned earlier, so I'm already anticipating anger at this. But I'll tell you, this is not to discredit the moment. It's a good moment. Remember, I'm not complaining, I'm just breaking this down. Gohan's transformation is a marketing moment, not a grand resolution to the character. As I will explain, I think Gohan deserves better than what he got. It was a moment of spectacle and certainly carried a lot of resonance, especially for Dragon Ball. But this moment of marketing power failed the character. The opening of the Android or Cell Saga is some of the best storytelling the setting ever gave us. There's mystery, expanded lore, a reunion of old elements to new, new characters, nuance to some villains, and inventive spins on others. Even the backgrounds and environments the characters move around in are more than Z's more typical barren wastelands. But let me take a moment to elaborate. Akira Toriyama, in his run of Dragon Ball, had three editors. His first, and I'll mess up these names, was Kazuhiko Toroshima, who would move on to be the head editor of V-Jump in 93. The second, who served as editor from the end of the Piccolo Jr. arc throughout most of Z, was Yu Kondo. The third, who took over halfway through the Cell Saga, was Fuyuto Takeda. This is worth at least a minor note because of how this relationship affected the writing of the series. Toroshima, infamously, despite not actually being editor at the time, was the reason why Android 17, 18, and Cell were created. Toriyama's original idea for the Android saga was for 19 and 20, Jiro himself, to be the main villains. Toriyama recounts, Toroshima, via phone call, referred to the two main villains as a geezer and a fatso. This resulted in 17 and 18. They were then greeted with a similar phone call, lamenting that the main villains couldn't be just some brats, and so Toriyama designed Cell. Cell, according to the Shenlong Times number 2 interview this information comes from, originally was going to stay in his first form, which would suit me just fine, as I always like that one the best. Maybe not so much the beak, but, you know. It was Kondo, his actual editor at the time, who said that Cell was ugly and needed to transform. Kondo would then lament that Near Perfect Cell looks like a moron, doesn't he? And his final form was rushed into the mix. This is probably also why Perfect Cell has a safe design and personality from a marketing standpoint, and is sometimes referred to as a budget Frieza. I mention all this to give context to my assertion that Toriyama can be easily influenced. 
he infamously didn't think about or write the story until the month he needed to draw it. So the quality of the writing usually stemmed from who was giving him feedback at the time. No one knows exactly, but one might draw a conclusion that it was during this time, during the phone calls and staff changes, that the writing became especially messy. In my personal opinion, the writing of the saga started to go downhill around the time that Seventeen showed up to fight Piccolo. The plot became very linear at this point, with characters showing up to fight Cell and not much else going on. Especially after he transformed completely. Krillin falls in love with Eighteen despite having never had a conversation with her. Can't say I blame him, but let's not be coy, he just thought she was hot. He's totally right about that, but Toriyama, by his own admission, can't write love, so he doesn't try. There's also some minor exploration of Trunks' relationship with his father, but that's about it. Not much is going on. This is also, coincidentally, around the same time that Gohan and Goku are training in the Room of Spirit and Time. Gohan's career so far looks like this. He has spent about a year training in the wilderness prior to the Nappa fight. The time from Nappa's attack to the destruction of Namek officially was a little under two months. Prior to Trunks showing up, Gohan had less than half a year of actual experience fighting. This means the bulk of Gohan's actual training came from the three years of mostly off-screen experience he had with his father and Piccolo. He also had no fights with any of the androids. The year of training in the chamber means Gohan had about four total years of experience of any kind prior to fighting Cell. Contrary to what's seen in the anime, in the manga there's almost no depiction at all of Gohan's training inside the chamber. There's one page of him standing in place, screaming because it's Dragon Ball. Nothing happens. Several chapters later, right after Cell transforms for the final time, Gohan is drawn in this same pose. Like he's been screaming for literally months now, I guess? Kind of a weird visual, whatever. This time his hair changes color. There's no context for it, no emotional arc, no reason to transform given. It's just a visual indication that Gohan did something. We see them in the chamber a couple of times afterwards, but it's just for Goku to explain Grade 2 and 3. There's no scene of Gohan going through an internal struggle. There's no scene of Gohan telling his father that he hates fighting. There's no scene of Gohan questioning why he's even in this room. Gohan is just a toy. He's still a living plot device and a marketing tool. He's still not a person. The reason why Toei added the scenes of him sparring with his father and begging Goku to attack him with killing intent is precisely because Toriyama did absolutely nothing with the character. All the time that should have been spent with Gohan talking to his father was instead spent on 13 chapters of absolutely nothing but Vegeta and Trunks fighting Cell. You get the idea. In universe up until now, Gohan hasn't had much of a life. Out of universe, Gohan isn't being treated as a person, he's being treated as a writing solution. His death's decision to make Gohan fight nearly comes out of nowhere. That's the point, of course, it's meant to be shocking. More importantly, it's totally out of Gohan's hands. Gohan didn't stop the fight and demand the chance to prove himself. In fact, Goku even intentionally avoided training for another year for no reason other than he'd already made up his mind on what he was going to make Gohan do, without telling him about it. Gohan is being treated as Goku's gun at this point. As this happens, there's one brief moment, a panel in Volume 34, Chapter 7, when Goku tells Gohan to fight, bring peace back to the world, so he can become a scholar. I've already covered this scholar nonsense and how it has no real basis with the character yet, but what's especially strange is that this is coming from Goku. Goku, who has never been shown to talk about anything at all with his son other than fighting. In fact, it's so bad that the first person Gohan admits his total disdain of fighting to is Cell. Piccolo even points out that Goku never even brought up this plan with his son. He's just assuming that Gohan will have the same response that he would have. Gohan, he's going to get his own son killed! That fool! That should tell you, they didn't have any off-screen discussions about this sort of thing in that year of training. Goku not only did nothing to prepare Gohan for this moment, he actively sabotaged it. It's around now that the writing of the entire saga starts careening out of control. There's never an actual fight between Gohan and Cell. Where the fight should have been, there are instead a pair of one-sided torture scenes. At the beginning, Cell tosses him around for a while like a ragdoll. Characters freak out, declare that he's dead, Goku corrects him. 
but there's no actual fight between the two, it's just establishing that the real fight hasn't even started. This is followed up by Gohan explaining the plot mechanic of his secret power to Cell, inciting Cell to start torturing the rest of the cast. This is the most flagrant case of emotional manipulation and narrative bumbling in the entire arc. Maybe the whole series. Toriyama could not figure out how to organically reach this point. A fully powered Gohan watches the rest of the cast be tortured, including a fully powered Vegeta and Trunks who went through yet another year of training, and it's all to try to create emotional tension out of nowhere, because there is none yet. The story has failed to create buildup, and so Toriyama has to resort to a nonsensical, manipulative scene to perform a last-minute, violent swing in tone and narrative. Goku's transformation had buildup. Arguably too much of it. Goku at his strongest wasn't even half as good as Frieza. The entire series up to this point had been about Goku's free spirit and his desire to protect his friends. His journey had gone from converting his enemies to discovering ones that were beyond redemption. Frieza embodied everything that could break Goku. His pride as a fighter, the lives of his friends, and even Goku's core innocence. When Goku is exhausted, near death, and starts seeing his friends cut down one at a time after having tried every solution the setting had established as a possibility, he snaps. The anime's padding may have harmed this, but the moment he transformed matched the pacing of the story. Gohan, despite deserving better, doesn't get this kind of buildup. It's all fairly sudden, and the tone of the fight is very frivolous. Goku didn't treat the training seriously before the Cell games. During the games, there's a lot of playful comedic scenes with Satan, lowering the tone even further. There's only one fight, so there's no buildup to the stakes. Cell himself doesn't even seem to treat it seriously. There are other characters that trained additional years to prepare for this moment, who are just ignored. And Goku's dismissal of the fight and tossing of the Zenzu being the Cell because Gohan supposedly would have too easy of a time? Diminishes the stakes even more. Basically, at this point, there's nothing in the tone of the story that could warrant Gohan actually feeling any sort of frustration, fear, or fury over anything that's happening. That's why we get the nonsensical Cell Juniors, who are all stronger than Vegeta and Trunks, while apparently not weakening Cell at all to create. It's also why Gohan, despite having lost no energy at all up until this point, just stands there. He even collapses on the ground, watching his friends get murdered, because Toriyama, the writer, can't figure out a way to raise the stakes or emotion of the scene. He needs to create buildup in the last hour of the story to a transformation that hasn't been earned. There's been almost no context whatsoever given to Gohan as a character. There's no tension. There's no stakes beyond Cell making a vague promise to blow up the planet if he gets bored. I must really emphasize, this entire writing sequence is transparent and pathetic. There is nothing to respect about this race to salvage tone. It's said the Buu saga was the start of Toriyama's disengagement from writing the series, but you can really start to see it rear its ugly head here. This is kept off with Android 16's head. What is it that finally sets Gohan off? In this blatantly artificial, manipulative scene with no actual story context to drive it, what will be the thing that makes Gohan lose it? Will it be the death of his father? The death of his mother? The realization that he hates himself and his life and his father for bringing him into a world he's never learned to love? It's none of these things. Gohan never met Android 16. Goku never met Android 16. They never discussed Android 16. There was never any depicted or even insinuated allusions to any knowledge by any character concerning 16's beliefs. Gohan wasn't even present when 16 was discovered, fought, or damaged. As 16 is a true android, Gohan couldn't even sense him on the lookout. The first time he'd ever seen or heard 16 was during the fight. So when this robot's head rolls in front of him, Gohan's reaction may as well have been, who the hell are you? There is no emotional weight to their meeting. This can only mean something, if anything, to the viewer, because we're the only ones who have spent time with the character. 16's actual speech doesn't even mean much of anything to Gohan. In the manga, it's all communicated in one page to hurry and get to the transformation. All he says is that fighting for the right reasons isn't a sin, some enemies can't be reasoned with, and that he wants Gohan to protect the animals he loved. That's it. First, Gohan knew about those first two things. After all, compared to Frieza, Cell is a playful scamp. As for 16's love of animals, 
This is the first time Gohan ever heard a thing about it. And it's not exactly an established driving motivation for Gohan to protect animals. Now, you can project whatever you want to onto the scene, or make whatever assumptions you need to, in order for it to have more weight. But on its own merits, it's a bad scene. The pacing is completely off. Nothing that would drive the scene has been established on screen with consistent theming. There's just not enough context to warrant Gohan's reaction. Again, I chalk this up to Toriyama's writing and the editorial changes combined with a long history of Gohan having little character presence. All these pacing and theming issues persist until the end. The fight again becomes one-sided in Gohan's favor. This is fine, it's a cathartic type of scene, but it also has no tension for obvious reasons. Realizing this, Toriyama writes the Goku sacrifice. Again noting how unsatisfying of an ending this would be, Cell miraculously comes back from a single cell. This somehow also Zenkai's him along with fully healing him, despite the fact that all his other generations never did any such thing. Excuses and headcanon aside, narratively, this is only to ensure he's now strong enough to pose a threat. That's the only real reason why this actually happens. Remember though, there was never a real fight. Gohan this entire time has never taken any damage. And so we get the Vegeta scene. Gohan is more than strong and healthy enough to deflect or negate this hit, but takes an intense amount of damage from what looks like a fairly basic attack. Again, the only reason why this scene occurs is because it is a lazy writing shortcut. It's done to give Gohan a bum arm and some last minute battle damage to make a final struggle look somewhat convincing. I reiterate. This hastily thrown together series of chapters are trying to emotionally manipulate you. It did not reach this point organically. It could not be more clear that Toriyama is in a panic and throwing excuses into every element of the fight to try to manufacture two visual set pieces. And again, I'm not dumping on Gohan the character. The writing here is doing a disservice to him. So let's stop. Let's stop here and imagine an alternative. I feel like this is important to cover because it's easy to criticize without solution. More importantly, without example of something better, it's hard for many people to get behind that criticism at all. How would the saga look if Gohan had been the actual focus? I'll try to make this quick, no promises. I don't want to be insufferable or pretentious, and this is a monster of a video already. Here's my example. Let's say Trunks comes back in time not to deliver heart medicine, but to give Gohan information, because that's who he has faith in. He doesn't trust Goku because they're the ones who failed and created his future, even if that isn't a fair way to look at it. Trunks spends a lot of scenes throughout the saga directly talking to Gohan. The androids aren't introduced as jokes, and it's not implied Goku could have stopped them. Even in Trunks' future, he was murdered like everyone else was. He wasn't an absent savior. Goku does not matter. In the first encounter with Jiro in 19, Goku is drained without realizing what's happening. Gohan steps in, noticing what's happening, but realizes he doesn't have the power needed to get the job done. After Vegeta shows up, Jiro decides he needs more information than he had and retreats. At the lab, Gohan sees something is off and refrains from attacking 17 and 18, but is criticized for it. When the fight with them breaks out, he tries to do what he thinks his father expects of him, and fails. But notices Krillin approaching them peacefully with more success. His instincts were right. After Goku's recovery, Gohan disagrees with his father about what needs to be done. Despite not understanding his son, Goku tells him that he needs to do what he feels is right. Gohan then is the one to go out and find the traveling androids, rather than waiting for them to show up at Kami House. He approaches them like Krillin did, but only seems to have success with 16. There's no fight until Piccolo engages them later. Either way, Gohan decides words aren't enough, and that he also needs strength. The Room of Spirit and Time is introduced in some capacity because of Gohan, not as a retcon. He proposes the idea to Popo, or goes through his dad to talk to King Kai or something. Personally, I hate that fucking room for a lot of reasons, but I'm band-aiding things together that I can show on screen, so... While the other Saiyans are just focused on power, Gohan is also planning. 
Many of the rescue scenes are his ideas. Gohan has more agency. This, this is the goal. In the original, he and Cell never met prior to the fight, which is novel in a way, but I'd have them encounter one another during the imperfect sequence, to give more context to how the two parallel one another. Cell is a child weapon in his own way, after all. This might be the most major change. Gohan wants to bring Sixteen into the chamber with him and his father. Sixteen isn't a life form, so it circumvents any two-person rule this version may have. Because I said so. He's also stronger than they are, and a resource to learn from concerning the androids. More importantly, it allows all three to have scenes together. The chamber scenes with 16 can have multiple functions. Android 16 is moving past his programming, he hates the lifeless room, but understands the importance of stopping his father's mad creations. After his repair, 16 sort of wants to kill Goku. He thinks about it. A lot, at first. Mostly for comedy scenes. Goku in tattered clothes, sleeping in bed to 16 would be like a wolf eyeing a glazed ham. Goku loves this, of course. Big, big turn on for Goku. Meanwhile, Gohan and 16 are actually starting the bond. I don't want to take away from the idea of Gohan and his dad finally having time together, but I don't think 16 is going to intrude too much on that. The dynamic between this android and Gohan is different than with his father. We get hints on how frustrated Gohan is about his life and the toxic framing he has for fighting. For 16, he communicates some information on Jiro, the dead son he was modeled after, how Goku affected both of their lives, as well as how little 16 really knows about the world he wants to go back to. Nature and a love of discovering a world neither has ever had much of a chance to explore is what 16 and Gohan bond the most over. 16, in many ways, is like Gohan, a son living an imitation of a life he has no control over, but still holding a love of the life they both can have, if they have the power to seize it. That's what's important to cover. Let's also say, during the training itself, Gohan does transform, but it feels empty somehow. Almost like the manga version, it's almost incidental and meaningless, it just happens. The anger his father had on Namek isn't there, it's just a physical change because the transformation comes easily for him due to his biology. And Gohan can feel it. He doesn't understand why, but he knows it's just another case of him being made into a weapon. The grade 4 training begins, but only 16 really understands why this is even a problem. In this version, Goku takes the training seriously. There's no lowering of stakes. He prepares as much as he can. There are also no Cell games held in the middle of nowhere. Instead, Cell's proposed contest is to release imperfect versions of himself onto Earth cities. They'll grow stronger as they absorb human life. As a result, all the cast has to be involved in the fighting in different locations. Satan can still be there defending his own city from Cell, although focusing too much on him would only do a disservice to the story. Goku does not forfeit, but simply can't continue fighting against the regenerating body of Cell. I know the idea of him giving up is novel, but I'm definitely willing to let that go. It would play out somewhat like the moment Goku destroys Cell's head. By all rights, Goku wins, because Cell's recovery should be impossible. Piccolo can't do that after all. It's a shocking improvement on the original. It makes sense that Goku, despite being weaker, would win by outmaneuvering Cell, but be cheated out of a victory. Gohan, who's been fighting alongside 16, senses this development and has to return on his own. Cell, full of glee over his victory by technical knockout, parades the city on a murderous death march, killing anything he sees. Soon, due to Cell and his sons, the whole world is emptied, on fire, in chaos, and he's enjoying his victory. A lot of the world now looks a lot like Trunks' future. Gohan arrives, an actual fight begins, but he can't do much. Cell does remark that it's unusual that Gohan is taking so much abuse, but either way, Gohan has neither the real strength nor the required experience. Meanwhile, the various juniors have been accumulating power and have beaten most of the cast apart from Vegeta and Trunks. Cell decides to recall them and prepare to leave the planet behind. His last game is to make Gohan try to prevent his father's death, knowing he can't. Goku is totally incapacitated. If Cell can reach and kill him as the world watches this final broadcast, he wins. This Gohan doesn't just sit in the dirt lamenting this though. He tries as hard as he ever has, and actually manages to press the already exhausted Cell. Sixteen arrives and tries to escape with Goku, glazed ham or not. 
But while Gohan can defend himself, he still doesn't really have the ability to stop Cell either. Gohan outsmarts Cell though, and again removes his head before Gohan can start destroying all of Cell's remaining pieces, some of the imperfect juniors interfere. Cell is pissed. He took another major injury, the same injury. Cell absorbed some of his own children. Because these imperfects have absorbed so many humans, he recovers a great deal. Gohan sustains major injuries along with everyone else. He can't prevent Cell from finding his father. Android 16, despite overcoming all of his programming, is nearly destroyed trying to stop him. Goku has a last minute trick or two, but they're futile efforts. So lines up a final shot. In a scene that mirrors Krillin's death on Namek, Goku dies having absolute faith in his son's power. His final word is Gohan's name. This should send Gohan over the edge, but it doesn't. In fact, Gohan doesn't even know what he's feeling. Realizing this, he loses his transformation and gets weaker. This is where the 16 scene comes into play. He tries a desperate attack, fails, and he's reduced to a head that rolls to Gohan's feet. This time, 16's final words are incredibly personal. After all, at this point, 16 knows everything Gohan has been thinking. They mirror one another, after all. Both are children fixing their father's mistakes. Both are like machines with no spirit, fighting because they have to. Both want it to end so they can discover the person they want to become. Here, 16 isn't manipulating Gohan. He's giving him his final words, because they're the words 16 also needs to hear. It's okay to feel resentment towards your father. It's okay to hate being born what you are. It's okay to realize that you don't even know who you are. It's okay to acknowledge that all of this is true because you can take it, own it, and use it as a source of righteous anger. Even if you die doing so, the beauty of being truly alive is what both of them always wanted. When Sixteen is telling Gohan this, it's from potentially two years of private conversations. It feels more like Gohan is admitting it to himself. His final words are that all life can be restored, but only if you're willing to make that life your own. Cell crushes the android, as before, commenting that he was built to be nothing more than a weapon. There's nothing there. There's no life to wish you back. Now we have context. This android parallels Gohan. Gohan cares about Sixteen because he also cares about himself. He also realizes that Sixteen really can't be wished back. Cell's comment that he was just a weapon and that there's no life worth recovering is exactly what Gohan has hated about his life until now. This self-loathing about his own nature, about Cell being that nature, telling him he has no choice, that he's destined to be a soulless puppet born to be destroyed, is what breaks him. That makes Gohan snap. That warrants a transformation. We build the character to a breaking point until a culmination of events causes a moment of change in both the character and the story. That is what Gohan deserved. That's who Gohan should be at this point. Someone who doesn't know exactly who he is, but knows what he loves, and he's going to protect it. Example over. I could sit down and rewrite everything, but we need to move on. I'll just say that the arc should have concluded by making it clear the entire story was about fathers and sons. Gohan and Goku, Trunks and Vegeta, Sixteen and Jiro, the entire cast and Cell. And even Cell's treatment of his own creations. Maybe he uses them to form that evil Genki Dama he always promised. Yeah, who knows. That transformation is the most important moment for Gohan's arc as a person. It should have been the point where he takes control of his own life. Unfortunately, it was the beginning of the end. That was his peak. And it was his peak because he just never was developed into anything more than Goku's MacGuffin, into the viewer's projection fantasy. And since that was never rectified as the Buu Saga began, that's the only framework we had for Gohan as a character. Our ability to satisfy ourselves through Gohan's victories. In the original canon, he still doesn't have much character. He's just a walking memory of one visual set piece. Toriyama was probably sick of Dragon Ball at this point. He used Gohan to try to subversively change the series into something else, and even he didn't like the result. Boo Gohan is a real disappointment, in-universe and out. He give up training, acts like an idiot, 
doesn't have much of a personality beyond being sheepish, isn't particularly helpful throughout the story, receives a bogus power-up he didn't earn at all, is outsmarted by an enemy he calls a retard, and ultimately doesn't play a part in stopping the villains. If anything, he just makes the situation way worse. I'm not going to rewrite all that. I just want to clarify. Trying to force Gohan to be the main character is a mistake. Even if I could rewrite it all, I think Goku should stay in the driver's seat. What fans usually are getting at is that the character is a great market option that they just didn't use correctly. Gohan, quite frankly, doesn't develop into a fun character. He does his Sentai bit, but that's about it. I understand why people like that bit, I get it, even if I think it's stupid, but that's all he had, and it wasn't enough. In fights, he's very boring, very serious. Like all the other secondary characters. Gohan's adult personality from Z into Super is pretty bland. I don't mind him just being a dad. Quite frankly, for the story we got, it's more fitting that Gohan would give up fighting entirely. The only reason why he keeps coming back is because of that market draw he still has, almost all because of one scene in the Cell arc. He's still being used as a projection fantasy, he still wears the mask. In general, I think adult Gohan should be portrayed as someone who, since the Cell fight, has embraced fighting, but in a totally different way. Rather than abandon it, he instead realizes that he's fascinated by it. He wants to study it in the same way that he studied nature. He also realizes that the world can't keep relying on individual people to save everyone. Usually in Dragon Ball games set in the future, Gohan has written a book detailing the secrets of Ki and his understanding of it. This in turn disseminates knowledge on how to use it to the rest of the world. I would place the start of that idea right here. I would also have him admit that he never really had a dream to be a scholar, whatever that is. The best gift you can give me is to keep on studying hard, Gohan. Then I'll have a scholar as arm candy. Especially in Super, this has no real payoff. He has a job reading books or something. He does big learns because he wears glasses and does a study. Big money have because big learn. History? Bi biology? What's he do? What the hell is his job? To read books and wear glasses? Anyway, that was his mother. He can still have his job learning books for science men, or whatever he does, but his study of key should be up front and center. So while he recognizes now that his mother didn't really understand what she was trying to get him into, he's still thankful for being instilled with a love of learning. Gohan, like his dad, should be someone who's fun to watch because of his excitement. Goku loves to challenge himself to fail, and Gohan should love to challenge himself to figure out how his opponent works. When he's in a fight, instead of angry-faced number lad, he should be really excited. The more bizarre the opponent, the greater the fascination. Same thing outside of a fight. New ice cream flavors, discovering a new book, watching someone learn to fly. It's important to get him away from being a stereotype of a nerd and into being someone who's just really excited about new discoveries. The more visible excitement and energy he has for just being alive and experiencing the world will make him more likable. When Gohan has to fight now, it's just work. He puts on the mask, pushes a strand of hair in front of his eyes, and that's it. He hates fighting. It's just a burden he has to deal with so he can go back to being himself. That needs to change. It's a wonder that the Gohan we see in Z and Super would ever write a book telling other people how to learn the fight. It feels like the last thing he'd do. An improved Gohan obviously should not like hurting other people, but the most important thing in his life should be helping other people to find the best versions of themselves. What is it about his own body that allows him to have natural gifts compared to humans, or even his father? He's going to figure it out. Considering his upbringing, seeing normal people unlock abilities that were considered exclusive to him would be one of the greatest moments of his life. Adult Gohan should be defined by the joy he's found in just existing and discovering what Sixteen wanted him to discover. That's the one thing I like most about Gohan and Super, except there it's exclusive to his family. His greatest source of happiness is seeing his daughter happy. So then, a Gohan in the Buu saga would have found Buu to be absolutely fascinating. How he works, why he works, where he came from. I can see a lot of comedic scenes of Gohan annoying Bobbity and delighting Boo with infectious interest and energy. He's not angry, he's determined. He's not scowling and calling Boo a retard. He's smiling and promising to find the good in him. 
by the end of the saga, Gohan, while maybe not landing the finishing blow, should be the one that figures out the right way to weaken and ultimately destroy Boo, all the while preserving what goodness he can find in him. The role I see for Gohan is of a proactive, dorky, but high-energy protagonist that discovers a similar joy in fighting as his father, but for totally different reasons. A family man who never gave up on training, but instead decided that focusing entirely on latent gifts was self-defeating. That's where he gets the idea to abandon Super Saiyan and instead focus on learning how to channel his ki less destructively. Maybe that's why he's supposedly weakened compared to Vegeta and Goku. He's given up on their path and is exploring things neither of them ever would. When he achieves the so-called ultimate form, it's not the result of a hilarious scene of an old man dancing around him for several chapters. It's because he eventually realizes how to do it, and through specific training of his own design, manages to realize it. And maybe more importantly, through his gifts, he helps other people achieve the same thing. Not through anger or emotion, but through a love of learning, self-edification, and self-discovery. He becomes a master. As I said, I don't like Gohan. One of my favorite scenes involving him is his green tracksuit scene, where he's utterly humiliated. And it's not because I hate the character, it's because I hate what they did with him. That's exactly where that character should end up, because that's what it deserves. I like Gohan as a father, because that's the only time he's been successful as a character. They just need to translate that Gohan into the market. In Super, he's still wearing a mask. They may be giving him his numbers and intensity back, but that thing walking around is not Gohan. It's just an action figure. It's a vessel for our projections. I want to like Gohan. He's, he's a good kid. He deserved better. At the end of Gohan's arc, with the cell fight as its middle, whatever happens to him from now on, I want Gohan to be a character that I love. That can happen, and it will happen, when the love Gohan has for his family translates into a love he can have for martial arts. A genuine love, not a burden on his shoulders or a necessary evil. Actual, realized ambition, and a love for what he was born as and what he can be. When the mask comes off, I want Gohan to be loved, because he loves himself. Alright, hope you guys like watching that. Anime videos always result in takedowns and copyright strikes, so do what you like with it. In addition to mostly dropping the persona this time around, I also got Greymind to edit this one together. Celebrate his mighty works, because making hour-long anime videos is something I'm willing to write and record, but not edit together. Probably won't do another one for a long time, if ever. Not exactly safe, relaxing content to make on YouTube anymore. The people that do anime stuff on YouTube for a living are resilient creatures. Like the aforementioned Totally Not Mark, whose name is actually Mark. If you want videos vaguely similar to this one, but you know, like, consistently good, check them out. If you want to drop a dollar or buy a shirt, links to my Patreon and Shark Robot are down there somewhere. Probably more importantly, I hope whether you agreed or not, it at least entertained and got those brain juices flowing. Take care of one another and yourselves. So long.